Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar about uh, risk management in software as a medical device development. My name is Laszlo Katona. I'm a senior consultant at Nanga Systems and uh, my main focus is uh, CodeBeamer and the medical and automotive industries. And uh, today I'm going to be your presenter on the webinar's topic. Today's agenda looks like this. Uh, we will start with a quick overview on software safety classification. Then we will take a look into software risk management. What are the main challenges or typical challenges? Uh, quick overview or high level overview on documentation that might be necessary from a risk management perspective. What are the software causes? and what are uh, software risk control measures. And uh, then we will take a look into a, an implementation of uh, a risk management configuration in PTC CodeBeamer. <clears throat> and we will finish uh, with a quick Q&A uh, to answer your questions. So if you have any questions during the uh, presentation, whether if it's the uh, PowerPoint presentation or the CodeBeamer presentation, uh, just feel free to submit your questions. So the software as a medical device development uh, is something where we have to compile with IEC 62304. <clears throat> IEC 62304 is a standard that defines the life cycle requirements for medical device software. The set of processes, activities, and tasks described in the standard establishes a common framework for medical device software lifecycle processes, applies to the development and maintenance of medical device software when software is itself a medical device or when software is an embedded or integral part of the final medical device. So this is the definition of IEC 62304. But what does it mean for us from the perspective of uh, risk management? Before we dig into risk management, we have to understand the software safety classifications a little bit. Um, it is something we have to do for our uh, medical device. The software safety classification is uh, not just a system approach, but can be used on software units and software items. A proper software safety uh, classification helps us focusing on what's really important, ensure that the device is safe enough by not classifying it too low, and we can avoid high development costs by not classifying it too high. You can see on the screen the three classes, class A, it means no injury or damage to health is possible. Class B means no, no serious injury is possible uh, or non-serious injury is possible, better said. Class C means that death or serious injury is possible. The classification doesn't tell us how safe the software is. This is a very important uh, thing to highlight here. It determines instead the process rigor for uh, your software development. Throughout IEC 62304, it is clearly indicated which requirements apply to which classes. And it is also important that the software items might have a lower class as long as they are traceable to the class determined for your software. How does the classification workflow uh, looks, look like? Uh, software by default, according to IC 62304, is always, uh, is always uh, classified as class C. And we have to basically justify in case we, if we want to uh, classify our software into a lower class. To do this, uh, we have to answer a question. First, if hazardous situation caused by the software, in case the answer is no, then we can safely classify our software as class A. In case it is, the answer is yes, then we have to evaluate uh, potential risk control measures 
And after the risk control measures have been evaluated, we can determine whether the risk is acceptable or not. In case of acceptable risks, the class is going to be, or the classification is going to be class A. In case the answer to this question or evaluation is no, then uh, we have to determine whether the resulting injury is non-serious or serious. In case of non-serious injuries, our software is going to be classified as class B. In case of serious injuries or death, uh, the resulting classification is class C. It is best to define and document the software safety classification as early as possible. <clears throat> Identify identifying a higher class late in the game, late in the development process might lead to increased costs, increased costs and additional work to comply with the newly introduced requirements in the development process. These requirements are indicated in IEC 62304, as I mentioned. So it is uh, <clears throat> quite important for us to define the appropriate safety class as soon as possible. Following the guidance of IEC 62304, it is important to keep in mind difference between ISO 14971 and IEC 62304 as following the guidance of ISO 14971 might lead to a higher classification due to the difference between harm and injury. As you can see on the right hand side, <clears throat> ISO 14971 uh, uses harm as, uh, uh, as a base for severity assessment. Harm in this context means injury or damage to health of people or damage to property or the environment. In case of IEC 62304, we are talking about injury, where serious injury means that uh, injury or illness that is life-threatening results in permanent impairment, necessitates medical or surgical intervention to prevent permanent imper impairment. So basically, the major difference here is that in case of IC 62304, we do not take damage to property or the, to the environment into account, uh, which is quite important because if we follow the standard uh, risk management uh, approach, according to ISO 14971, our classification might result in higher uh, classification class. And uh, that again, leads us to uh, higher or more requirements to, compl uh, com to comply with and higher development costs. In order for us to determine the uh, classification uh, or the class for the software safety classification, we have to evaluate the uh, hazardous situations that might occur, and we have to determine the uh, probability and the associated severity. In case of software development, uh, we, it is, and we will talk about this a little bit more in details uh, later in this presentation, uh, we have to separate P0, uh, probability of occurrence, into P1 and P2 to effectively determine the probability or the appropriate probability. The reason behind this is that P1, because we are talking about software, P1, uh, which is one part of P0, uh, is usually considered to be 100% because if, we, uh, if a failure might happen in case of software, it is most likely to happen. And uh, if we would not separate P0 into P1 and P2, then the, the typical approach would be, which is actually not uh, correct, to say that P0 is, is 100%. But that would mean that the failure would take place or the failure will happen. And the harm that is represented by P2 will also happen but we wouldn't want to release such a device that will 100% uh, uh, cause uh, a, or result in a hazardous situation that will lead to a harm. So this is the reason we have, we have why we have to separate these two. 
In case of the software safety classification, uh, we have to talk about the software itself and external factors. This is why P1 is represented by P1 software and P1 external, where software related P1 is 100%. As an example, if we just take P1 software into account, uh, P0 is going to be a result of uh, a, which is a semi-quantitative value, uh, is going to be a result of uh, P1, which is one, 100%, multiplied by P2, which in this example is 1000. In this case, it means that P0 is going to be one out of 1,000 in terms of probability, which by definition means this is a frequent occurrence. And uh, <clears throat> to describe this with the value, the associated value is going to be five. In case of severity, we have a similar uh, table where we have a rating to describe the severity. There is an associated definition and an associated value to it. As you can see, uh, since we already talked about uh, potential uh, hazardous situations and those, if they will lead to injury, those uh, classes show up here as well. You can see that negligible, which is class A, uh, basically doesn't mean that uh, the hazardous situation would lead to uh, injury. Class B means uh, minor and, uh, C, uh, well, non-serious, or in this case, serious uh, uh, severity. And class C is critical and catastrophic. Why do we need these values? Because we have a classification matrix, which we can use. And using the classification matrix after determining P0 and uh, the severity values, we are going to be able to determine what is the safety class for the uh, software or software item that we are evaluating. It is important to highlight that uh, the same software system uh, might uh, result in different hazardous situations. All these have to be evaluated, as you can see here. For example, the first hazardous situation might not lead to any injuries. So that's going to be class A. Uh, the second one might lead to a non-serious injury, which re will result in class B. Hazardous situation three might result in a serious injury, which leads to class C. We do have the ability to uh, apply risk control measures uh, to mitigate these uh, potential outcomes. So in case, for example, hazardous situation number two, uh, we apply a risk control measure. And this risk control measure uh, helps us to uh, lower the class. And in this case, uh, the, class, uh, the classification will be class A uh, in this scenario. Still, our software system overall will be classified as a class C uh, software. Uh, from a safety classification perspective, because that is the highest class that we have assigned to uh, one of these uh, scenarios. The main challenges, uh, so this is, uh, this covers the quick overview of the software safety classification. Now let's move on to software risk management, where we have three main challenges that we might face <laughs> Uh, during our risk management activities. The first one is how to manage probability of software failure. We briefly touched this before, but we will uh, get back to this topic a little bit later. Uh, risk assessment templates in software risk management, if they are applicable or how should we uh, apply these changes, or oh, sorry, these templates uh, to software because typically these are non-software related risk management templates. For example, ISO uh, 14971. Um, and the third one is the uh, confusion uh, that is caused by software risk controls versus risk controls implemented by software. 
And this is probably the most important uh, topic that we have to address because there is a difference between risk control and risk control. Software con uh, risk control implemented by the software means that software is used to reduce the probability of uh, harm for functionality outside of the software itself. And software risk controls, these mean that uh, we reduce likelihood that a failure within the software can contribute to a hazardous situation. And in this uh, topic, uh, soft, uh, risk management in case of software as a medical device development, we are focusing on software risk controls on the software system level. The determination of the uh, probability of occurrence of harm uh, according to ISO uh, 14971, it, uh, it is something that we can perform with the help of P1 and P2 values where P1 is the uh, probability of the hazardous situation or, uh, to occur and P2 is the probability that it will lead to harm. And while, uh, and the software risk management is all about how we reduce the likelihood of software to, to contribute to a hazardous situation. This is all about reducing P1. P2 is about reducing the likelihood of harm occurring. Uh, risk controls reducing P2 are likely to be outside of the software and should be documented in system risk analysis. The right mindset when we start working with software risk management is that the software failure always occurs. The reason behind this is that uh, it is almost impossible to estimate the probability of a software failure. The probability of occurrence of harm, P0, what we've seen on the previous slide, if it is set to, uh, in some interpretation, it's, uh, interpretations, it's set to 100%. But as I mentioned earlier, this is not correct because it implies that the failure will always occur and it always leads to harm and we wouldn't want to release such a software. The right attitude in software risk management is a negative one as we assume that our software will always contribute to a hazardous situation. The good thing about this is that there, are, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. And in this approach, we take actions to minimize the probability of failure through risk control, software risk control measures. Software risk control measures will help us to reduce the probability of failure, even though it is hard to estimate the level of reduction. First, we will have to identify the potential causes. And uh, for this, we can use, uh, we can basically, we can break up P1 into three different areas. Uh, development process represented by P uh, process. Uh, in an IEC 62304 class B or class C based development process, it's already going to be a kind of risk control measure uh, because it is a requirement for us to develop, uh, sorry, to document the development process applied uh, for our device development. For class A, there is no, uh, there are no such requirements in place but it is a good practice to have at least your own checklist in place, uh, which you can execute during the uh, development. And again, this, this might act as a kind of risk control measure. The second part is the system related probability P system. Uh, it relates to the architectural design. On this level, we can deal with causes applicable to several software items and causes. Software item uh, related probability is P item. Uh, on the item level, we can identify causes and take actions by adding functionality to mitigate them. However, it is good to keep in mind that adding more functionality will mean that the new fun functionality can also fail. And we will talk about this a little bit later, but uh, it is important that all the, not only the original set of requirements or functionality, but everything that has been added 
to mitigate uh, risks, uh, risk control measures, those also have to be tested as part of verification. So P1, as you can see, uh, is a result of uh, multiplying P process, P system, and P item. You can always introduce other P's, uh, so to say P system, uh, P system A, system B, but be careful because multiplying too many low P values might lead to P1 zero, uh, P1 equals zero. Uh, a good practice is to define the lowest possible P1 level that you accept in risk management uh, in the risk management plan, regardless how many Ps are used in the calculation of P1. And the next step is basically, or the last challenge that we uh, have to talk about is the kind of documentation and an integral part of documentation, of course, in addition to a risk management plan is the hazard traceability matrix. This, what we see on the screen right now, this applies to the uh, before mitigation state. So we identify the hazard, the, reasonable for, the reasonably foreseeable sequence or combination of events, the hazardous situations, uh, harms, uh, P, related P0, and the severity, and whether or not the risk is acceptable. To extend this for software risk management, we can break up P0 into P1 and P2, and uh, we've already seen this before, but basically through multiplying uh, P1 and P2, we get the semi-quantitative value of P0, which we can <clears throat> use again uh, together with uh, severity to determine whether or not uh, the uh, risk is acceptable. It is also a good practice to use comments in case you want to revisit the document later uh, to base, well, not to justify, but to remind yourself why did you apply a certain P1 or P2 value. Um, this is a good practice. It's not required. So in a final official documentation that you submit, you, you don't have to submit these comments. You can remove these columns or you can just simply hide these columns uh, in a spreadsheet or in the tool that you are using. The, in this uh, very simple example, we can see how the P1 and P2 combination determines the value of P0. It, again, this is very similar to what we've seen in software safety classification. P1 multiplied by P2 uh, defines the P0 semi-quantitative value, which is the probability of occurrence. In this case, again, we use one to represent that uh, P1 is 100% and 1000 uh, to uh, define P2. Together, these will give us a frequent uh, P0 uh, with the value of five. And together with the severity of five, uh, this leads us to a not acceptable risk. This is something that we define with the help of an evaluation matrix. Both the evaluation matrix and the uh, P0 table is something that might be different in your company. So it's not something that is uh, prescribed by the standard, but with the help of the defined P0 and uh, severity values, uh, we are going to be able to determine whether a risk is acceptable or not. After mitigation, uh, with the help of risk control measures, uh, we can lower P1. Uh, and you can see here that P1 has been reduced uh, to uh, 1,000. Uh, of course, these risk control measures will have to be uh, verified. So we have to document the verification of effectiveness. And uh, going back to the previous slide, uh, we'll see that uh, the combination of the new or the uh, reduced P1 and P2 values 
we fall into the remote category. So this is the one millionth probability, one in a million probability, where the probability value is two. And together with uh, the severity value of five, this is going to be something that falls into the yellow area instead of the non-acceptable part of the uh, evaluation matrix. We also have the ability, but it's a little bit more complicated and might lead to unnecessarily low uh, P1 value to assign a P1 or uh, P1 sub value, so to say, to each uh, risk control measure that we apply. It's up to you how you would like to approach this. Uh, but again, this, some, this is something that, that is good to keep in mind that uh, assigning uh, reduction levels uh, to, e to different uh, uh, control, risk control measures might lead to a, an unnecessarily low P1. So this is a decision we have to make in our risk management processes. We talked about uh, the development process and uh, how it is required for class B and class C devices. This is one of the reasons why it's important to define the software safety classification early in the game. It is not required for class A devices to have a documented development process, but uh, with a uh, good and documented development process, we can already have kind of a risk control measure uh, through, the, uh, through the processes that we have applied. The main areas are, are requirements, uh, development or coding errors in this case, or how it's represented in the presentation, testing and uh, bug management or defect management. In case of requirements, uh, the requirements have to be understandable and complete and reviewed by all stakeholders. In case of coding errors, it is a good practice to have coding guidelines in place, but without enforcing coding guidelines, they do not do too much good for us. So it's good to have static code reviews and peer reviews in case of testing, determine what type of testing do we apply. For example, regression testing is executed. Are the testing or uh, activities complete? Do we have all the scenarios covered? And what is all also kind of a uh, good practice is to make sure that uh, all risk-related requirements, including all risk control measures are tested. Uh, and of course, the best, best practice is to always test because over time it will lead to better software quality. In case of bugs, we, we can uh, evaluate how many uh, through uh, reports, we can evaluate how many bugs did we find and what are the critical, what is the criticality of these uh, identified bugs. So the development process in case of class B, uh, in case of a class B uh, uh, device, if well documented, in the, in the risk management or software development plan might reduce P1 related P process to 1%. In case of class C, it can be even 0.1%. Uh, and the claim level of reduction is basically something that's up to you, uh, but uh, this is something that you can develop, uh, sorry, document as P process value uh, in the risk management or software development plan. And then this level of reduction can be applied to all software risks. The software risk management documentation requirements are defined in IEC 62304. There are three main activities, analysis of software contributing to hazardous situation, risk control measures, documentation of risk control measures, documentation of verification of risk control measures. And uh, by risk management activities should be continuous throughout the project life cycle to include risk management, for example, of software changes. It is good practice to start working on it 
as early as possible because late discovered risks can impact both software safety classification and the complexity of design. Also, it enables you to request requirement changes on the system level outside of the software system itself. And uh, I think this is it's just me repeating myself, but with this, you can save cost and uh, save a lot of time. And uh, of course, the uh, level of complexity can be appropriate to the, uh, to the product itself. In general, uh, when we are talking about traceability of software hazards, we are talking about relationship between object and information, which is similar to how a database functions. Ideally, the documentation should be easily searchable and available to be quickly regrouped. And shifting around these boxes, uh, will result in the extended version of what we've used in the software safety classification, the sequence of events. From here, we just shift focus from software system to software item. And here we will make an assumption that we need to change one of our RCMs and uh, we have to perform an impact analysis. Uh, in this case, we have to review a, if the hazardous situations that are linked to it, uh, confirm if the change is still suitable uh, for these hazardous situations, and assess if the risk control measure is still meaningful, uh, meaningful uh, mitigation for the software causes that are traceable to the hazardous situation. The verification might change depending on how the change affects the software items. For example, a range check that's the same uh, risk control measure uh, might be uh, something that affects software items differently. And when it comes to regression testing, it is always a good practice, as I've mentioned earlier, to rerun all software risk-related tests. This is not a requirement in IEC 62304, but in many cases, it is easier to do so compared to documenting justifications for not doing it, not to mention the positive effects on <laughs> quality itself. For this purpose, uh, it might be a good approach to use requirement or task management tools such as PTC code Beamer or Windshield RVNS. In case there is a need for uh, physical documents, there is always a possibility to export and print the information stored in such a tool into a Word document or into a PDF document. And uh, the benefit of such a tool is not only that we can apply the uh, simplified traceability, but we can also apply a fully extended software risk management traceability system because software items have to have trace or well, source files have to trace to software items. You might identify traceable software causes and these and there can be numerous software causes identified. Traceable hazardous situations uh, are to be documented related to those. We have to document risk analysis. We have to identify uh, risk control measures which can be also, there can be numerous uh, risk control measures in a, documented for our device. And of course, after that, we have to perform verification, which can be unit testing and test scripts. And all these can feed or actually will feed into the documented evidences. In case of the traceability of software hazards, we are focusing on software causes. Uh, to start listing out potential software causes related to a software item might not be the easiest task in the beginning, but a great inspiration can be the document that you can see on the uh, screen, it's, uh, uh, on, uh, on the slide. And uh, you can also, uh, because here we have some uh, software causes, potential software causes that might be applicable for your medical device software. 
but the potential software causes or uh, the potential sources of software causes in general are bugs, hardware, software systems, so, uh, software of unknown provenance, users, uh, end users, or uh, users that do not have good intentions, uh, namely hackers. So these can be, uh, these, these are the more general uh, groups for uh, software causes. But again, you can use this IEC document to start working on listing out these uh, causes uh, for yourself. In the traceability of software hazard uh, and causes, uh, in the traceability uh, or the software hazards and causes are the link uh, between software items and hazardous situations. And throughout risk, uh, risk control measures, you mitigate either the cause or the hazardous situation or eventually both. What we see here is a more simplified diagram, but you can see that uh, on an extended diagram, uh, it is more real life like uh, to have a combination of potential causes lead to a hazardous situation. So it's not a single cause from a software item that leads to the same hazardous situation. Sometimes you might have different uh, combination of software causes uh, following the guidelines uh, of the of ISO 14971, the updated traceability would look something like this, what we can see on this slide right now. When it comes to software risk control measures, appropriateness must be assessed for every situation, as there is no software risk control measure toolbox that you could apply to all software risks. In ISO 14971, it is called risk control option analysis, but in IC 62304, we are excluding the manufacturing aspects. So basically the risk control, up, uh, risk control option analysis would look something like this. Number one, inherently safe design. Uh, number two, protective measures in the, uh, protective measure in the medical device itself. And number three, information for safety and where appropriate training uh, to users. Good practice uh, is starting with defining a safe state where the software or the, the medical device uh, cannot cause harm or can cause very little harm. This helps us preventing a situation getting worse as by the time the failure is detected, we might not know what other failures it has uh, led to. This is not a requirement of any standard. However, the goal of a risk uh, control measure is to detect if something goes wrong. And in this case, the software has to know what to do next and the safe state is a good next, it might be a good next step. But uh, <clears throat> what is the approach here? So according to uh, uh, item number one, the inherently safe design, keep the software as simple as possible because the more functionality and the more risk control measures might lead to more complexity and with that might lead to potential failures. In case of protective measures, we have two approaches. Uh, we, can't, we can uh, prevent potential uh, failure causes or we can work with risk control measures within the software, but in this case, we are aiming to detect the failure instead of preventing it. For example, range checks, limitation of interfaces, limiting access to settings, why treatment is happening, or access control. These are external factors, but there might be a need for internal risk control measures, such as data integrity checks, calculation errors, uh, uh, resource hardware resource management. And uh, for number three, informing and training uh, users is basically key. And luckily in software, you do have the ability to enforce such trainings easily by granting access only after the training is completed. Or you can have the user hit an OK button to acknowledge the information presented. But of course, it, this doesn't mean that uh, the user actually read the information on the screen. And last but not least, 
software risk control measures. Uh, we have to document the risk control measures. Uh, we have to define them. We have to include them in software requirements, assign appropriate software safety cl classification to items implementing risk control measures. And again, we have to verify uh, the requirements that uh, might be a result of risk control measures and the risk, and the risk control measures themselves as well. And as I mentioned earlier, a great help for these can be a uh, requirement or task management tool, such as PTC Code Beamer or Windshield RVNS. So next, we will take a look into the an implementation based on the presentation in co in PTC Code Beamer. On this screen, what we see is a Code Beamer project. This is a Code Beamer project uh, that is based on the medical software engineering template uh, provided by PTC. And I have slightly changed this so it uh, it follows the, even the, the presentation itself. Uh, CodeBeamer is a 100% browser-based tool. For those of you who are not familiar with this uh, ALM tool, it's an application lifecycle management tool, and it enables us to uh, manage and configure uh, processes uh, that's, that uh, are applicable to uh, highly regulated and highly safety critical industries such as medical uh, and uh, when, it, when we are talking about medical, the uh, software as a medical device development. You can see here uh, the implemented traceability or at least a snapshot of the implemented traceability we have the identified uh, harms, hazardous situations, identified requirements. These are all traceable to each other. And we do have a uh, what we call a tracker, a logical container uh, for risk analysis and evaluation. This acts very much as a, an Excel spreadsheet. If we are double clicking on this, uh, that will be uh, the first thing you might uh, uh, that you might notice. The big difference compared to a, an Excel spreadsheet is the ease of traceability because uh, those containers that we've seen before are actually house, housing the hazards, uh, sequence of events, hazardous situations and harms that we have identified. They are all traceable to each other. It is very easy to use a tool called the Traceability Browser to run reports uh, to identify, uh, for example, uh, potential uh, impact of a change in a uh, risk control measure. We do have the ability to document P1, P2 values, and uh, Code Beamer is uh, capable to, based on configuration, it is capable to automatically calculate the P0 value and together with severity, uh, it can uh, calculate the, uh, whether the risk is acceptable or not. Similar to what we've seen before, uh, we do have the ability to document the evaluation matrix uh, we have we call this risk matrix diagram in Code Beamer. I've used the same values that we and basically the same uh, matrix that that we've uh, that we've seen before, where we have the P zero values documented from improbable to frequent, severity values documented or configured from negligible to catastrophic, and based on the uh, P zero and severity values. Uh, Code Beamer will place the risk entries automatically into the matrix. Uh, compared to a simple uh, Excel spreadsheet, uh, Code Beamer has the not only has the ability to uh, to automatically update field values, but we do have, for example, the ability to uh, document values that are automatically taken over uh, by other 
entries, for example, uh, harms are managed in a dedicated container. For example, we have a hypoglycemia harm where the severity is documented as critical. And in case we change this uh, to just uh, out of curiosity to negligible, upon saving this, uh, the updated severity will be automatically updated on every risk entry that uh, has the hypoglycemia selected on it. And upon refreshing the screen, you will see that uh, severity is now uh, negligible instead of critical. And because of the change in severity, the risk acceptable value has been changed from not acceptable to acceptable. And such changes, including the changes of, uh, for example, P2, if we change this to One hundred, then uh, these will be automatically documented in the history of the item. Every item in Code Beamer is uh, subject of uh, versioning, so uh, we don't have to worry about documenting the changes. Uh, in an audit scenario, we are going to be able to easily show what life cycle this particular risk item or every other type of item requirements, test cases, tasks uh, went through over time. Uh, scrolling to the right-hand side, uh, we do have the uh, necessary uh, columns for the off documenting the after mitigation state. We can perform risk control option analysis here you can see the risk control measures. A uh, nice thing about Code Beaver and its traceability, you can see a suspected batch here, which means that in case we change the uh, risk control measure or any traceable item to, let's say, non regular maintenance and testing, the suspected batch will be triggered immediately. And uh, basically this will help us to get notified about changes that potentially affect our uh, current work item that we are looking at. In this case, a risk management related item. And uh, if you remember in the presentation, we talked about the impact of risk control measure on uh, uh, other traceable items and how we have to assess uh, <clears throat> appropriateness uh, for software causes, uh, hazardous situations. This is something that helps us to perform these activities after the change has been executed. So if for some reason we forget about the impact analysis, Code Beamer will let us know that uh, there is something to look at uh, in case of this risk control measure. Then we can document the verification effectiveness, whether something, whether this change is implemented or not. And then we can uh, document the residual uh, P1 value and the residual P2 value. And based on these, we just we just have to refresh the screen. Uh, Code Beamer will automatically uh, calculate the uh, P0 value, which in this case is going to be improbable because the probability values are quite low. And uh, with the same severity, we reevaluate if the risk is uh, acceptable or not, giving us the residual uh, risk accept a uh, risk uh, risk acceptable value as uh, acceptable in this case and uh, as i've mentioned uh, this is something that is uh, uh, based on traceability for this purpose we can use a traceability browser to create reports that might not be based on a table view what we've seen before so with this, we can easily create the necessary reports. 
and not only to risk controls, but we can also uh, include uh, any requirements uh, that might affect our risk controls or that might be affected by our risk controls. Currently, there are not many, there are no requirements. So this is also something that gives us the feedback that uh, we have to implement these risk controls on the, or we have to document these risk controls on the requirement level as well. And all this can be easily exported into Word or uh, Excel documents. You can use your company specific templates. So in case you need a paper-based format of the data presented in CodeBeamer or stored in CodeBeamer, that can be easily done. Even you can you can even export uh, directly into a PDF into into a read-only document. So that concludes the demonstration. And now let's take a look into your questions, if there are any. Currently, we don't have any questions. Uh, I hope that's because the uh, presentation was informative enough. But in case you have any questions after the uh, presentation, uh, feel free to contact us using any of the presented uh, contact information and reach out to us with any questions. We are uh, very happy to answer them. All right. I would like to thank you for your attention and time today and see you in our next presentation.